thank you very much to everyone who has joined or uh, who are in the process of joining and in particular in particular, I'd like to thank our presenters and our presenter tonight, Dr. Tilman Tau, for taking the time out of his day. And today, um, this will be the last webinar um, um, he's going to uh, do for us. And he's, uh, Tim Antarach is going to talk about a topic, and this fits in very nicely um, with the last um presentation actually because it refers back to the um, beginnings of anti-Semitism and the current forms of um, anti-Semitism. Simon Tillmantag is going to talk about um, anti, very con current anti-Semitism and the stereotypes and images um, that we know from classical uh, Christian anti-Semitism. So this refers back to uh, the beginning um, to the beginning of the traditional uh, age-old anti-Semitism and the current forms of anti-Semitism. Before Tillman's going to get started, just to let you know, we can see it here on the screen. Um, the I would like to refer to his two books about that topic. Um, it's called Israel, the Eternal Scapegoat. Goat, which was published in 2016, and then his current book, uh, Devilish Omnipotence, uh, where it is about the connections between modern um, anti-Semitism and Christian anti-Semitism. And maybe you could say that uh, about the context that we do have a debate um, where exact, what kind of uh, types of anti-Semitism and how that there are and how they're connected. There are people who say that anti-Semitism we've seen is different than um, hatred of Jews. And um, in the second book that we can see, here, um, Mr. Talmach does m make a good argument uh, for continuity um, and says that these types of anti-Semitism cannot be um, separated. And this is exactly what today's presentation is going to be about. And you might have understood correctly, you're going to talk about the uh, Christian origins before you then um, talk about the manifestation of these ideas in the uh, current forms of anti-Semitism. At the end of the presentation, the session is going to be a bit longer. He asked for talk, but talk about a little longer. We've got 15 minutes for the presentation, and then we've got 15 or 20 minutes for questions and answers. Um, Tillman, again, thank you very much for joining, and we are looking forward to your presentation. I'm going to uh, let you share your screen. Um, why doesn't that work? Stop sharing. Okay, there you go. Uh, can you see me now? Yes, we can see you and you can share your screen if you'd like. Well, great. Uh, dear Mark, thank you very much for the introduction and the invitation. Thank you very much, um, Daphne, uh, for the introduction. Ms. Birch, thank you very much for the introduction. Translation is great that we have that option. I'm going to talk uh, just on an hour about the connection between ancient Christian um, hatred for Jews and modern jihadist hatred of Jews. I can see here, which I'm slightly confused. Please confirm the language spoken. I think I'll have to um, take care of the settings now. Could you give uh, me some feedback? Can you still see me? Yes. Yes, everything's all right. Okay, so I have a different kind of strange text on my screen, but if you can all see me, that's great. Okay, so the title of my talk may initially be confusing. After all, Islamic anti-Semitism has been emerging in a particularly radical form for some time. And on the 7th of October, it was particularly cruel. Um, to give you a small first hint, that um, it may well have something to do with the Christian foundation myths. And in order to do that, present that, I will first show you one of the great works of art by uh, the Palestinian uh, artist Mohammed al Halvashri, the, um, a thoroughly anti Semitic artist from Gaza who um, was considered an important voice in the 2020 Documenta 15 art exhibition in Kassel. And I'm going to 
check whether I can do that, whether I'm able to do that. Yes. We're not there yet. One moment, please. Don't worry. Okay. Okay, now you should be able to see the painting. Can you see it? Well, this is one of the more uh, uh, known uh, works by Al Havashri. As you can see it here, it uses Christian imagery and is titled Tariq Al Halam or The Way of Suffering, um, which is also known as Via Dolorosa. In reference to Jesus' path of suffering, we can see a Palestinian who's depicted here on the road to Golgotha, facing his murderous Israeli soldiers. Instead of the cross, he carries a key. This is the symbol of the pestilent cult of the displaced, if you'd like. And um, in a way, this makes the figure a symbol of the entire Palestinian people. The message of this picture is thus, just as Jesus was once crucified by the Jews, the Palestinians are being murdered by the Israelis today. Mohammed al Halvashri, um, the artist of the picture, is not a Christian. Is he's a Sunni Muslim, and even after the seventh of October, he makes no secret of his hatred of Israel. And he's he's quite popular. Um, in Germany, tomorrow he, he's going to um, present and be able to exhibit his pictures near Castle. And I will show later, or try to show, that the Islamic anti-Semitism is a descendant of Christian hatred of Jews. But first, um, we will take a closer look at the European anti-Semitism, anti-Judaism, for that reason. However, it would be a futile endeavor to even begin to recount the almost endless history of Christian true hatred in this lecture, because that's not what it's all about. If I, but if I want to do so, you could start with the first major Christian pogrom against the Jews in the 4th century. Um, this took place in Kalinicum, today's Raqqa in eastern Syria. Um, the forced baptism. And the Jewish text should also be mentioned, as well as the fact that the man of the church spoke of a Jewish race as early as the 7th century. Of course, the Lateran Council of uh, 1215 should be mentioned, which, amongst other things, obliged Jews to wear the yellow spots or similar identifying marks on their bodies. A measure that was only abolished in Prussia after the French Revolution and then restored by the National Socialists with the so-called Jewish Star, with explicit reference to the old Christian tradition. At the beginning, the Nazis themselves, just to let you know as a, a historical um, curious fact, at the beginning, the Nazis themselves had even decreed the uh, infamous medieval yellow stain um, in parts of the occupied East. I'm going to show you two pictures here as well. Here you can see two, two people by the German occupied Poland uh, in 1941 with a yellow uh, stain. And we can see uh, Jews with a yellow patch in the men's ghetto during the German occupation in 1941. And here, once again, this uh, that's just the backup of my second book, um, this is also a Jewish man um, from near Minsk. And here we can see a Jewish merchant from Worms uh, with a yellow ring, um, a picture from the 17th century. In an outline of the uh, Europe of Europe's anti-Semitic history, uh, we should also include the blood accusations, the legends of ritual murder and desecration of the host, which have been popular since the high middle ages. Ages and amongst our uh, most most pernicious anti-Semitic slanders, uh, the 
Jews, as I said, would kidnap Christian children, kill and torture them, as they had already done with Christ on the cross. The ritual murder was therefore a ritual reenactment of the murder of Jesus. Um, the Jesuit um, magazine La Civilità Cattolica, which was under the control of the Pope, was still spreading such ritual murder legends at the end of the 19th century. And 30 years later, the National Socialist Tabloid de Sturmer, in particular, ran rampant ritual murders propaganda. There were uh, several special issues on the subject of ritual murders, for instance. Much more uh, could be said. Uh, for example, about the curious fact that um, fanatical right-wing radicals today sometimes target the church in general and the Jesuit order in particular, and sometimes suspect them of outlandish conspiracies. With regard to the history of the Jesuits, however, it should be emphasized that from the 17th century until the autumn of 1946, they had a particularly anti-Semitic admission rule. Only those who could prove a true free descent over several generations were allowed to become a member. Um, this was modeled on the Spanish laws of the so-called limpieza de sangre, the purity of blood. Um, they originated in the 15th century and remained in force until the 14th century. These blood purity laws did not only prohibit Jews from accessing educational institutions and um, churches and state offices, but also uh, those Christians who themselves or whose ancestors had converted from Judaism to Christianity, the so-called conversos. Anyone wishing to claim these rights therefore had to present carefully documented family trees confirming that the candidate had not a drop of Jewish blood. This was because Jewish blood was said to be infected with the guilt of the murder of God. The conversos were accused of having accepted baptism only as a pretense and of secretly remaining Jewish. Thousands of conversos were condemned and uh, burned by the Spanish Inquisition as a result. Baptism did not help them. During this time, Christian Christians repeatedly spoke of the Jewish race and even of the quarter and eighth Jews. That the Jews under Christian rule, unlike under National Socialism, could at least have escaped persecution by converting, that Christian so-called anti-Judaism therefore had the mitigating circumstance that the Jews had ultimately always attained equality through baptism. So that belongs to the realm of religions. Um, it might have been uh, the case sometimes, but not always. So these laws on the purity of blood, which are far too little known, are nothing other than what is commonly referred to as racial anti-Semitism. They are, as Simon Wiesenthal once said, quote, the forerunner of national socialist Aryanism, end of quote. And indeed, the... Na the um, National Socialist Aryan Certificate uh, certified no more and no less than the Christian confession of the ancestors up to the generation of the grandparents. Um, in the G German uh, Empire, if you wanted to apply for that kind of certificate, you had to um, present the Christian baptism certificates of their four grandparents, and many people are not even aware of that. The National Socialist repeatedly invoked Christian role models to justify their anti-Semitic laws, namely the Spanish blood purity laws and also the Jesuits anti-Semitic admission regulations. For more details on all of this and much more, I would like to refer you to my new book, um, Devilish Omnipotence, but instead my lecture will focus on my assertion of the Christian myths as the foundation of modern anti-Semitism or to be more precise, as the foundation for those features of modern anti-Semitism that distinguishes it from racism. That is the first important point, we still often encounter the naive um, view that anti-Semitism is a variety of racism. Um, above all, this fails to recognize um, that the victim of the 
racist is usually devalued as inferior, as poor, and contemptible. Above all, the racist complains about the physical presence of those perceived as foreign. According to racists, these strangers have no place here. Um, they do not. They're supposed to um, stay in the territories that they come from. The anti-Semite, on the other hand, sees the mere existence of Jews as a problem, regardless where they live. Um, so, accordingly, the National Socialists work towards uh, destroying the Jews worldwide. To a certain extent, the anti-Semite valorizes the Jews. They perceive them as powerful, rich, and clever, insidious, conspiratorial, and threatening. And during my research, I came across a number of statements that provided impressive proof of this. Adolf Eichmann, one of the most terrible Nazi criminals, described the Jews as an enemy who was, quote, mentally superior to us, end of quote. Similarly, uh, Adolf Hitler assisted that the Jews were blessed with, quote, higher intelligence than the masses. This perception of the Jews as a powerful threat makes anti-Semitism particularly dangerous. For the anti-Semitic act, um, it always appears to the anti-Semite as a self-defense against a Jewish attack. Just think of the slogan, Germans, defend yourselves, do not buy from Jews. Defend yourselves implies an attack. Um, Therefore, the Nazi propaganda was full of the fact that the Führer wanted peace, uh, um, but the Jews wanted war. And nowadays, uh, Palestinians' propaganda also regularly hallucinates Isra and re Israeli aggressions against which it would only defend itself. So I maintain that the typical anti-Semitic image of the Jews is an echo of certain Christian narratives. In this image, the Jews are the secret string pullers behind the authorities. They are the ones who pay agents with the money to steer the course of history. They are the ones to, who seek to destroy our non-Jewish collective and thus our identity by means of invisible machinations. In this picture, the Jews always and reflectively appear as the aggressors, whereas the non-Jews are the eternal victims of the Jews. This pattern, which is at the, at the core of anti-Semitism, actually only emerged with the rise of Christianity. Well, um, now a, a whole series of questions now arise. Didn't pre-Christian anti-Semitism also exist? That could be a question. Secondly, which Christian narratives are supposed to have shaped this typical image? Thirdly, do these images really still have an effect on people who have long since renounced religion? And fourthly, are there is a strong uh, Islamic anti-Semitism that probably has nothing to do with Christian legends, or does it? I can only deal briefly with the first point here, um, but I think you could um, write uh, whole, whole um, papers about that. To speak about pre-Christian anti-Semitism would be misleading at the very last. We have hardly any useful sources from pre-Christian times. The uh, Egyptian literary Yeah, Arpion is often cited, who is said to have once even accused the Jews of having carried out a human sacrifice. However, the same accusation was also leveled by the Greeks against other peoples in equity, by the Romans against the early Christians, and by the Christians against the Gnostics, the Martinists against other sectarians. However, we have no evidence from this period of time for the specifically anti-Semitic uh, image of Jewish diabolical omnipotence. In fact, the Jews were generally able to practice their religion undisturbed in pre-Christian antiquity. It is also certain that uh, group-specific resentments were omnipresent in ancient Egypt, Greece, and the Roman Empire, and affected uh, the most diverse groups, and the wars um, were also regularly religiously charged. 
Um, interestingly, just to let you know, it was uh, primarily anti-Semitic ancient historians of the German Empire, such as Edward Meyer, and later also the National Socialists themselves, who repeatedly insisted on free Christian anti-Semitism. I'm going to show you um, just one image here. Here, the um, so-called Völkische Beobachter, the People's Observant, an article about um, uh, opponents of the Jews uh, in antiquity. And they say that uh, here, for example, um, from where it is claimed uh, that there had always been an anti-Jewish defense movement since the appearance of the Jews. Well, this blames the Jews for their own persecution because if anti-Semitism existed in every area, um, independent of the social structure, uh, it caused, must, according to the clear subtext of the claim, must lie in a specifically Jewish character. From the anti-Semites' point of view, there can be, well, there can be no, there can therefore be no epochs free of anti-Semitism. Well, uh, secondly, on the um, central question of, of which uh, Christian natives uh, have shaped anti-Semitism, we first hear from someone who you should know, Julius Streicher, the Franconian leader of the NSDAP, who was labelled the Jewish beta number one in the judgment of the Nuremberg trials and sentenced to death. And in his political testament of 1945, he um, gave a, a biographical account of the origins of his anti-Semitism. A quote, when I came to school, and heard of the story of the suffering of the saviour of Christianity from the mouth of the priest in a religion lesson. I was filled with horror when I was told that the Jews had felt no pity in the face of blood-covered saviour, had not been satisfied with the torture of the prisoner, had even demanded crucifixion. That religious lesson and the sentence was emphasised by Streicher. And this religious lesson, a first inkling came into my life that the nature of the Jew was a particular one. End of quote. Well, this assertion that the Jews had enforced the death of Jesus against the Roman occupying power can already be found be found in the New Testament. And after it was decided at the Council of Nicaea in, in 355 um, that Jesus was of divine nature, not of human nature. The Jews even advanced from Christ killers to God killers. And only in league with the devil, uh, the Christians concluded, could the Jews manage to carry out a veritable murder of God. Um, this is how the image of the devilish Jew came into being. As far as I know, no one has yet realized that the Acts of the Apostles already assigned to choose a role in this, um, which was to become a model for anti-Semitism, namely of the string puller. Quote, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of the Nazarene, ye have taken, and by the hands of the lawless men ye have crucified and slain him. So what does that mean? So the Jews killed Jesus, but not with their own hands, but by the hands of the lawless. The lawless men are the Romans who lived without the Mosaic law. Um, in the New Testament, the Romans are therefore regarded as mere tools, as puppets of the Jews, who are said to be the real masterminds behind the crucifixion. Unfortunately, uh, it, I feel it is necessary to point out that the New Testament accounts in this regard are, of course, a historical. The earliest texts of the New Testament were written about 20 years after this event, of this possible event. Non-Christian sources with reference to Jesus of Nazareth uh, are not found until the end of the first century. Even the historical core of the person of Jesus is difficult to grasp. Um, however, scholars of antiquity agree that the Roman occupiers of the time and Pilat uh, in himself rigorously carried out death sentences. The crucifixion was also the usual method of execution for rebels 
on the, the Romans. So they claim that a irreproachable Roman governor ordered the execution of an innocent man under the pressure of the Jewish population or a faction of it is about as credible as the idea that the Jews organized the terrorist of the attack of 9-11. It implies, contrary to all historical reality, that the Jews of Jerusalem were a powerful force, the clandestine string pullers behind the political decision of the Roman authorities. This myth created the archetype of the image of the diabolical omnipotence of the Jews and their and their uncanny influence on preferably political decision makers. The New Testament thus actually propagates the first great anti Semitic conspiracy legend. Not only that, uh, also worth mentioning is the collective admission of guilt for the crucifixion of Jesus, which is foisted on the Jews in the Gospel of Matthew. Quote, then all the people cried out, his blood be on us and on our children. This um, phrase from the Gospel of Matthew means nothing other than we choose to serve death for all time because of our murder of God. Well, um, using that phrase, the whole nation, the author of Matthew's Gospel left no doubt that the Jews are, as a whole were to be punished for the death of Jesus, so not just one group within the Jews. And of, because of the words and all, and over all of our children, Jewish guilt, according to the general interpretation, existed for all subsequent generations, and as late as 1890, the Jesuits wrote, this curse applies to all of their descendants. And this uh, blood um, curse was used in order to start uh, pogroms and violence against Jews and justify that over centuries. Well, now, the anti-Semite, the um, psychoanalyst, Ernst Simmel uh, once explained that he hates a Jew because he believes that a Jew is to blame for his misfortune. When we realize that the central theme of Christians is the death of the Lord and Savior, their Redeemer, then it is hardly surprising that the misfortune of the crucifixion has become the epitome of all misfortune and that um, Jewish guilt has become a kind of mystical, primal guilt of the Jews. The Jewish guilt for uh, Jesus' death on the cross thus became the guilt for every misfortune of the anti-Semite. The notorious motto of the Stürmer, which was emblazoned on the front pages of every issue, thus only described a constant attitude to life of the anti-Semite. The Jews are our misfortune. Martin Luther formulated this very similarly in uh, 1543 when he wrote uh, that the Jews were, quote, uh, were and still are our plague, pestilence and all misfortune. That uh, the Jews had brought immeasurable guilt upon them with the crucifixion of the Son of God. Um, even during the National Socialist era, practically every child has learned this. 95% of Germans were members of one of the two major churches. A uh, further 3% described themselves as believers in God and were also socialized as Christians. And um, during that time, and in, in lessons and religious lessons uh, children often heard about the story um, that you usually don't hear as often anymore that the Jewish people have murdered our saviour our regime the image of the Jews who in the form of Judas uh, betrayed Christ for 30 pieces of silver and were crucified and uh, crucified him on the cross um, crops up again and again in the National Socialist Programme there are just a few examples. The Jews cowardly nailed the world liberator to the cross. Hitler declared, declared as early as 1922 in his speech to 4,000 NSDAP members. Jesus was the first great anti-Semite, Hitler wrote in Mein Kampf. 
Uh, he had taken up the whip against the Jews to drive them out of the temples and continued. For this, of course, Christ was then beaten and nailed to the cross. Julius Streicher, the number one Jubater, hypocritically asked in 1924, um, stylizing himself as a victim of the jargon of the concerned victim. He said, quote, who knows whether the time will not come and that when one may no longer say at all that uh, Christ was crucified by the Jews. End of quote. Uh, between 1923 and 1944, the inflammatory newspaper, the Stimme, referred to Judas as the Judas wage of 30 pieces of silver at least 173 times. Like Hitler, Jules Streicher remained religiously Christian until his last day. For him, even the Nuremberg war crimes trial was kind of second Golgotha. Golgotha. And the crucifying me, he complained to the court psychologist in a cell in 1946 and continued, I realize uh, three of the, the churches are Jews. Well, let's move to another important point. Uh, ever since the legends of the poisoning of the well, during the time um, of the Black Death, the Christians had been convinced that the Jews not only hated and killed Christ, but also had the whole of Christianity in their sights at the same time, in the same way. Actually, the genocide accusations against the Jews or against Israel actually has a roughly 700-year-old Christian tradition. The Jews, uh, it was said from the 14th century onwards, wanted to wipe out the whole of Christianity with a terrible poison. As the Jews possessed a diabolical power to murder God, they were also willing and able to carry out the annihilation of Europe's Christians. The legends of the Jewish well poisonings mark a considerable intensification of anti-Semitism. While the accusations of ritual murders and the the creation of the host still related to individual local events. The idea of a Jewish world conspiracy to overthrow entire societies was emphasized in the notion of planned mass position poisonings. Since then, the Jews have appeared not only as a religious, but also as a political danger as potential um, genocides. The programs against the Jews during the plague years were the most, the worst until the nation, National Socialists came into power. Hundreds of thousands of Jews were murdered, burned, or executed. Hundreds of thousands were expelled. Martin Luther also accused the Jews of genocidal intentions because of the aim of the Jews was to, quote, kill Christians wherever they could, end of quote. Modern German anti-Semites then hallucinated not only of a Jewish threat to Christianity, but of an impending genocide of all non-Jews. Hitler wrote in Mein Kampf that the Jews wanted the, quote, annihilation of all non-Jewish peoples, end of quote, that they were waging a, quote, war of extermination and, quote, an extermination of peoples. The Jews, um, as the Tablet of Stimme wrote, would, quote, exterminate Christianity in a gruesome and thorough manner. The Stimme publisher, Julius Streicher, spoke of the Jews wanting to carry out the greatest ritual murder of all time against the German people. Later, um, we can find um, these uh, genocide denials. Um, the right-wing uh, extremist assassin who attacked visitors to, in a, to a synagogue in um, California in 2019 fantasized about a Jewish plan to commit a genocide against a European race. Ten years ago, the British neo-Nazi Nick Griffin spoke of leftist capitalists and Sunnists 
um, pursuing a final solution, namely the greatest genocide in the history of mankind, the final solution to the Christian European problem. All these uh, genocide accusations, which have which we have for 700 years now um, and that we're confronted with for 700 years and their um, target to choose um, of course they have nothing to do with the israeli arab conflict but um, they are nothing but and uh, this is quite obvious they're nothing else than just a pure anti-semitic delusion well, the Nazis repeatedly hallucinated about a planned Jewish genocide against the Germans. This is not surprising as the Germans, probably more than any other nation at the time, identified themselves as purely Christian. There was, as Daniel Goldhagen once remarked from the 14th century onwards, a, quote, thought-based German identity. Um, a intellectual fusion of Germanists and Christianity, whereby the term German alone contained a Christian element. In the National Socialist Illusion, the Jews not only made Christ to the cross, they actually intended to do the same to Germany. In particular, Germany's defeat at the First World War and the Versailles Treaties were perceived as a Jewish plan to destroy Germany. The Nazis had set out to avert this danger of genocide against the Germans by the Jews. And the image they repeatedly conjured up for this danger was significantly uh, the crucifixion of Germany by the Jews. Once again, the myth of the murder of God provided a template. The Jew is a destroyer of nations, Hitler said in 1923, for example, and further, quote, we want to prevent our German from suffering the death of the cross, end of quote. Shortly after the so-called seizure of power in the spring of 1933, the Schumer sounded the same horn. can see a caricature here um, from the Stimmer tabloid um, from spring 1933. I'm going to read out the subtitle. It says, the Jews cru crucified Christ and nailed him to the cross and believed him dead. He has risen from the dead. The Jews uh, crucified Germany and said it was dead and it has risen more glorious than ever. The uh, Christian delusion of the murder of God committed by the Jews even accompanied the phase of intensification of National Socialist anti-Semitism towards uh, annihilation anti-Semitism. Hans Frank Hitler's Governor Central General in Poland reported in his memoirs how Hitler developed fantasies of extermination against the Jews in 1938 and said that he might have to carry out the um, blood curse. So... In other words, this fateful self-condemnation that is attributed to the Jews because of their alleged murder of God in the Gospel of Matthew. Hitler, according to Frank, sat the following one evening. Quote, in the Gospels, the Jews cried out to Pilate that when he refused to crucify Jesus, his blood be on us and on our children. I, Hitler continued, I may have to carry out this has end of quote the Shoah as the execution of the blood curse of the New Testament as retribution of the uh, supposed crucifixion of Jesus Hitler was not alone in this view at the Ulm Einsatzkommando trial in 1958 for example a pastor when I asked why he had done nothing about the mass shootings, stated that he thought that it was right for the Jews because the word his blood come on a, upon us and upon our children was now being fulfilled. Even if this motivation is not always so blunt, and the image of the dangerous and also aggressive and um, guilty Jew has become an integral part of cultural memory over the century. 
not least, according to Saul Friedländer, due to the early influence of Christian religious education, Christian liturgy and everyday expressions of Christian origin. The Nazis certainly knew that uh, children were susceptible to this. This is shown by a speech by Jule Streicher um, that he gave to Nuremberg teachers in 1938, from which I like to quote. Jule Streicher uh, talks to Nuremberg teachers. And if I were still at school, I would say every day at the beginning of the lesson and at the end, children do not forget get. I said that the Jews have been murderers since the beginning and that their father is the devil. I believe that young people who have young Jews have this hammered into them in the early days of their lives uh, will be ready to give their all. So I beg you, educate the children to a healthy hatred. Jesus was a hater of the Jews, create this hatred. End of quote of Julio Streicher. Well, I think that Christian anti-Jewish imagery has outlived the Christian faith, so to speak. So even if anti-Semites, unlike most Nazis, have turned their backs on the religion at some point, the idea of a Jewish Jewish danger and Jewish original guilt haunts their brains, at least unconsciously, an echo of the Christian legend of the murder of God. Unconsciously means that the anti-Semite does not even know that these ideas are at work within him. And he's not even lying when he says, I have nothing against Jews. But he suspects a mystical guilt on the part of the Jews due to a nebulous crime that cries out for retribution. A Jewish primal guilt that makes the bearer of this idea feel that the murder of Jews is somehow right for them. After all, the Shoah was possible because this Christian idea of the Jews' original guilt was deeply rooted in the thoughts and feelings of the perpetrators and fellow criminals. I'm sorry um, to uh, you sharing your screen, but um, we can't say any image. Is that supposed to be like that? I don't have an image. No, no, just right now. No, we, no, no, don't worry. Um, it's like, it looks like you're sharing your screen, but we can see a black background. So do you have an image you'd like to show us at the moment? Just keep it like that and continue. It's fine. It's fine. Well, I, I, I would like you to be able to see. So we can see you. Uh, we can see you. That's fine. You can't see can't see me in full screen, right? Uh, well, just just continue. It's not bad. Well, well, how do I continue? Well, okay. So where was I? Right. So. I think if you um, take a more intensive look at it, you could say that without that um, foundation, those ideas that uh, became an integral part of European culture, the uh, this primal Jewish primal um, um, guilt would have not the Shoah would not have been possible without this idea. Um, just how unwilling. People were to come to terms with these issues um, can be seen, for example, in the fact that the Christian Passion and Eastern festivals openly presented Jews as Christ killers even decades after the Shoah. The famous Oba Amagal Passion Play, for example, only re removed the aforementioned blood curse from the text in the year 2000. In the Polish village of Ruchniak, uh, the custom of a folk festival around Easter time in which the participants the theatrically celebrate the Christian revenge of the supposed murder of Christ by the Jews still exists to this day. And I would like to share a short video of the event from uh, 2019 with you. Um, and the video that you're going to see now is from the year 2019. Thank you. 
I'm not a fan of trigger warnings, but the images that you can see um, are quite disturbing. Well, I'm going to uh, leave the uh, image up here. This Christian custom is called, um, it's from Puchnik, a village in Poland, close to the Ukrainian border um, from 2019. This uh, custom is called Judas Burning. And um, it seems like a kind of exercise for the pogrom. Uh, this is not something done um, in the church but by normal Christian worshippers. This cult still exists in a similar form in Germany, um, but its anti-Semitic background tends to be concealed uh, in this country. At the German Judasfeuer, uh, sometimes also known as Jaudasfeuer or Osterfeuer, Easterfeuer, uh, straw doors are usually burned, sometimes more, sometimes less clearly representing Judas. The Rias Bavaria Initiative counted such Judas burnings in over 2,000 German towns and cities at Eastern um, in 2023. So, um, let's take a look at that straw doll. To this 2019, Streichter, um, it says here, Streichter is uh, Polish for traitor. And you can see the uh, typical stereotypes, such as a hooked nose, temple curls. And here we can see uh, an element, which is part of all of these images, is a, a wallet with the fam famous 30 pieces of silver. And this wallet, um, has now significantly shaped the image of Jewish greed and corruptibility, but also of the financial and scheming Jew. After all, the New Testament describes Judas as corruptible and Jews as so rich that they were even able to pay the crucifixion of the Son of God. Over the centuries to this day, this anti-Semitic image has survived. I'm going to show you um, a few images quite quick, rather quickly, actually. These are images from um, the 12th century, um, both uh, figures as opposed to represent Jewish people. And you can see a um, kind of jar for money. Then here from the 16th century on the left, you can see Lucas Kranach the Elder. And here you can see Judas, and he he has his wallet or his purse with him here. And this depiction over here, we can see uh, a, a purse or a, um, a purse for gold. Um, these are anti-Semitic pictures from the 19th century. These are images from the Nazi era. Um, where the purse is shown to be a lot bigger and the, the bag for money is a lot bigger. And here is a caricature from the year 2019 from the uh, Portuguese magazine um, Sabato. And this is, of course, not just a criticism of Netanyahu's um, policies or his willingness to form coalition with racists. It is simply an expression of the anti-Semitic view of Israel. And even if you show solidarity with the Jewish state today, you're often labelled as a traitor and an agent, um, paid 
for why this really empathy, for example, just like Judas, Judas uh, who betrayed his own collective with the Nazarene as its leader for just 30 pieces of silver, which brings us to another point, which is Israel. Um, because it's hardly surprising that on the basis of the unconscious image of the Jews as murderers of God, um, it is tantamount to a nightmare if the Jews have even even have their own state, the only state in which they can govern themselves instead of being defenseless and powerless at the mercy of the arbitrariness and uh, prosecution of a Christian or Islamic majority society. The um, reflex, the common reflex that the true state is always the aggressor in the Israeli Palestinian conflict, even though its enemies openly announce its annihilation and try to put into practice, um, is in turn fueled by the Christian image of the aggressive Jew who crucified Christ and nailed him to the cross. The um, Conspicuous lack of empathy towards the Jewish victims of the conflict and the regular identification of the Palestinian side, which is only fantasized as a passive victim of the Israelis, can hardly be explained without the idea of a Jewish original guilt. About two years ago, when a Hamas terrorist murdered Jewish civilians in Jerusalem in cold blood and was finally eliminated by Israeli security forces, we had to read headlines like Israeli policemen shoot Palestinians on the Temple Mount. And on German television, it says Israel, a Palestinian shot dead. Against, well, of course, in the small print, uh, you can usually uh, read something about the background, but the headline is the way it is, and this is what's, um, what you remember. Against the backdrop of a Jewish primal guilt, the striking willingness to believe the Hamas claims about alleged Israeli crimes, about numbers of victims, um, you really sh shouldn't believe that as easily because we Germans, we Christians, we non-Jews, we Palestinians, we have been the victims of uh, Jews for 2,000 years. That's what they say. So uh, should Hamas, Hezbollah and the Iranian regime one day succeed in fulfilling their dream of destroying Israel, then some people in this country might have the vague feeling that the Jews, the Israelis, have basically only received their own and just punishment for their original crime somehow it serves them right and it was said in the uh, Einsatzkommando trial um, that it somehow serves them right other typical characteristic of the characteristics of the anti-semitic views of Israel must also be seen as echoes of the new of new testament ideas just as the Jews once um, were the masterminds behind the crucifixion of Jesus, the state of Israel appears to anti-Semites today as a kind of world of Muppet masters. In Mein Kampf, Adolf Hitler already saw a state of the Jews as an organizational center of the international world legacy. In a, in a speech as early as 1920, he said about a possible sinist state, quote, everything should be directed from there. Today, or, oh, well, the uh, pompous talk of the influential Israeli or Jewish lobby um, bears witness to the same spirit. In that sense, the Jewish people control the press, etc. And I say pompous talk because, of course, there is an Israeli lobby, but um, there's all, even if it's just. Um, Week, there's also a German lobby, a Palestinian lobby, an Arab lobby, an Iranian lobby, a, of course, a Russian lobby, as we all know, and so on. The Vatican already openly um, acted anti Israeli in 1948, and before that was a talk of a Bolshevik Jewry in the Holy Land, and also of 
Zionist world problems. Zionism was even described as a new Nazism by Catholics as early as 1949. An infamous perpetrator victim reversal in the view of the fact that only a few months earlier, the Israeli war for independence had seen many Holocaust survivors fighting on the true side, while there were a number of fugitive German national socialists in the Arab ranks. The accusation of the murder of Christ can be found in United Nations documents. The Jewish people crucified the founder of Christianity, declared that the Arab representative Emil Guri in 1947 at the United Nations when negotiating the petition plan of the United Nations. And in 1948, some Protestant th theologians then demanded in all seriousness that the, that the Israeli Supreme Court should officially revoke the crucifixion fiction judgment against Jesus. While during the Nazi era, the idea was widespread that Jews had not only crucified Christ, but were also up to the same thing with Germany, so a genocide against the Germans. Meanwhile, during that time, we fight in Palestinian propaganda again and again, and to this day, the blunt idea that Jews would crucify the whole of Palestine. Here, for example, a propaganda postcard from the late 1930s during the so-called Arab Revolt. Like 2,000 years later, Palestine, just like Jesus 2,000 years ago, the whole of Palestine is now being um, nailed to the cross. This uh, image is not an exemption. Uh, here we can see a post of the PLO or Fatah, as was very popular in the 1970s. Palestine is being crucified on the Star of David, that is, by the Jews. Here we can see um, the poster at a uh, PLO press conference in Amman with all of the big PLO leaders. Uh, Kama Nasser, Yesian Nafet, Nafi Havadme. Now, we all know that various Islamic actors pose the greatest immediate threats to Israel today. First and foremost, Iran and um, its more or less dependent proxies, Hezbollah, um, than the Houthi in Yemen, etc. But however, it's often forgotten that with the PFLP, one of the most dangerous Palestinian terrorist organizations is of Christian origin. Its founders, Wadi Hatta and George Habash, were Orthodox Christians. The PLFP has carried out countless terrorist attacks over the past 50 years, and it was also involved in the massacre of the 7th of October. Uh, let's take a look at the attack in August 2019 in which the 70-year-old Israeli um, schoolgirl Rina Schnerb was murdered with an explosive device. The main perpetrator was Samir Arbit, a Christian and member of the PFLP. The Israelis were able to arrest the murderer, and afterwards the official daily newspaper of the Palestinian autonomy published a cartoon that I would like to show you as well. At the top, it says the name. I think it's covered by this bar here. I don't know. I can see the Arab name at the top. Maybe I can. At the top, um, it says the name of the attacker, Samar Arbit, and you can see him on the cross. So the message is, once again, just as the Jews once crucified Jesus, so they treat the non-Jewish opponents today. The idea of the state of this picture can... Uh, can often see um was 
um, a American claimed that um, the Palestinians uh, co constantly um, experience Golgotha. And the idea that the state of Israel as army would repeat the crucifixion of Jesus on the Palestinians today is part of the standard repertoire of the anti-Sionist agitations, um, not just with amongst Christians, but also amongst Muslims. Um, as early as the 1920s and 30s, the Jews of Palestine and the Sionist underground organization Haganah were repeatedly attacked by Muslim Christian associations. These groups claimed the unity of the cross and the crescent in the fight against the Sionist project and against the Jews. So you could imagine it like a um, joint parades, parades after Friday prayers. Um, I, the, where the Muslims would then go to the uh, next Catholic church and together they then um, thought about the um, they were protesting at the day at the anniversary of the Balfour Declaration. In the Middle East, this unity more or less persists to this day and I would like to introduce you to a particularly colourful representative of the unity of the cross and crescent um, after the founder of the Israeli state, Hilarion Capucci, the uh, Jerusalem Archbishop of Jerusalem, of, of um, uh, the Greek Catholic Church united with Rome. You can now see him here with uh, Yasser Arafat, the icon of the so-called Palestinian cause. Uh, Hilarion Capucci was uh, caught by the Israelis August 1974, doing nothing less than smuggling weapons for the PLO. Um, his official Mercedes, his official um, company car, in which he was able to travel unchecked to Beirut, to, from Beirut to Jerusalem as a dignity, Dre was packed with machine guns, hand grenades, time fuse, and, it's, and explosive. It also more emerged that Capucci had previously procured heavy weapons for terrorist attacks. Here you can see him being led to court by the Israelis, and after his arrest, um, there was a considerable limitation from the Vatican, while the PLO celebrated him as a matter and continues to do so to this day. Here we can see a propaganda poster from Lebanon. Um, the Archbishop with an AK. Okay. Uh, could you soon finish because we um because six o'clock has passed. Well, I'm trying to hurry up. I'm going to try to uh, finish it quickly. Um, here we can see. This is, uh, well, Capucci um, was sentenced to 12 years in prison in Israel, but then um, he was allowed to leave after three years. Um, but he was, wasn't was allowed to um, take part in Israeli politics, but he did not, um, as you can see here. Well, only after the... I finished my book. I um found further resources about Capucci. Um, just quickly. Um, what is worth mentioning? Capucci himself said, or at least in a in a series of documentation by Al Jazeera, Capucci is of course celebrated as a um a hero, and they say that Capucci is the one who um. Um, provide them with weapons in the West Bank. And his, in his autobiography, he declared uh, that he has preached and uh, that it was the uh, Jewish people who have crucified the Jews and that he has um, founded the first uh, terrorist cell in Jerusalem. The meeting took place in the archdiocese. And without any sense of wrongdoings, the archbishop also admits to have smuggled two Tusha rockets into Jerusalem, which were then placed near the King David King David Hotel, whereby, quote, Capucci, one of the rockets was aimed at the Western Wall. They planned massacre of Pre uh, 
choose only food because the perpetrators were taken by surprise. An archbishop as the um, as a um, most important weapons supplier um, for anti-Semitic terrorists, in my opinion, it is evidence of a certain bright spot. I'm trying to uh, shorten it here and talk about the unity of cross and crescents from the um, Jewish air uh, from the Muslim point of view. Abastaki, for instance, a part of the Central Committee of Hatta and Sunni Muslim said in summer 2019, we are Muslims, we are Christians because Jesus, our Lord, is Palestinian. The Jews crucified him on the Via Dolorosa. The official daily newspaper of the Palestinian Authority regularly emphasizes that the Jews crucified uh, Jesus. The Syrian government newspaper Tishrin wrote that the Palestinians today would, quote, be crucified every day by the hands of the American and true Zionist ex executioners. Even infants are not safe from crucifixion, end of quote. Um, the um, map pieces of the Syrian and Iranian regime repeatedly spread the uh, uh, legend of the Jewish murder of Christ. In April 2015, a pro-government Iranian news portal rehashes the Christian uh, ritual murder legends and the author blithery names one of its sources, quote, the German magazine Der Stürmer. Um, you can still read that uh, online in Farsi. Um, I'm really uh, moving to the last point here. That's still important. Um, because all, with all of that, it is uh, not surprising because the Quran was very much influenced by Jesus. Um, it was mentioned uh, several times. It was mentioned um, in 108 um, verses, and he's one of the most important prophets. Um, actually, in the um, the Islam Islamist world, talk about the Jewish tar Jews targeting. Um, Jesus, but in the Quran, it uh, talks about the crucifixion of uh, Jesus and the question of the guilt of the Jews. But the interpretation in the Quran um, is diverts from the Christian interpretation. The um, it says that the um, Jews tried to kill him, but they didn't. We certainly see they did not kill him. Actually, they uh, made him there hero instead. Um, they also claim that the Jews targeted Muhammad and um, this uh, idea was taken on by the um, Christians because according to uh, Johannes um, the Arabs quote beware Muhammad of the Jews for, by God when they see him and recognize him they will see to do him evil end of quote. The two tribes of the Ar Arabian Peninsula are said to have tried several times to kill Muhammad, but they failed each time. This is what the Islamic historiography says. Um, according to the Islamic view, the Jews are therefore not primarily dangerous, as in Christianity, but are above all inferior and incapable rather objects of ridicule than of deadly hatred. This image is repeatedly reflected in traditional Islamic hatred of Jews. For example, when the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem declared on the radio that from his exile in Berlin in 1943 that the Jews had always been the losers in history. Or when during the anti-Semitic programs in Hebron in 1929, people chanted um, the that the Jews are cowards and cowards and they shall come out. So um, the historical basis for this idea of Jews inferiority was also the military defeats that, according to tradition, the Jews suffered against the armies of Muhammad. Unlike the early Christians, who were a weak minority facing a non-Christian superiority when they were developed, when they developed the doctrine, the founder of Islam was able to achieve a considerable increase in power during his lifetime. He became head of state, commanded armies, levied taxes, and enacted laws. This constellation led to the Jews being tolerated as subjects of the Islamic community, provided they accepted a series of humiliations that varied from region to region and from era to era. This is the Islamic legal institution Ostima, 
of Dima. With the Islamic image of the Jews who had at least attempted to kill the Prophet, Jews, uh, Jesus and Muhammad, the idea of a Jewish danger and therefore also the susceptibility to anti-Semitic conspiracy is inherent. Because it does contain this Jewish danger. But as soon as the Jews rebelled against their demistators, Islamic hatred of Jews came closer to modern anti-Semitism in word and deed. The emancipation of the Jews in general was already regarded as a revolt. The most shocking expression of Jews' emancipation and of Jewish opposition to the concept of the demi sectors, however, was the founding of Israel and above all its ability to defend itself. Because after all, one of the most important rules of the Dima was that Jews were not allowed to carry weapons and defend themselves against attacks by Muslims. Um, so there are uh, comments by Said Qutb, the chief ideologist of the Muslim Brotherhood and its Palestinian offshoot, the Hamas. So that uh, he made comments to this effect. And his text, uh, which was published in 1950, which called Our Fight Against the Jews, he wrote in his text, quote, um, the Jews again returned to evil deeds. Then Allah sent uh, Adolf Hitler to rule over them. And today, too, the Jews have returned to evil in the form of Israel, which causes the Arabs um, sorrow and suffering. So may Allah send people down and uh, upon the Jews to inflict the worst kind of punishment, end of quote. The, well, the worst kind of punishment on the 7th of October, we got a glimpse of what this punishment is supposed to look like. And the sexualized violence of the massacre stands for the humiliation and degradation that is to be impo imposed on the Jewish demis. To summarize briefly, in Islam, the Jews are under special suspicion because of the attempted murder of Christ. However, they have failed due to weakness. They are tolerated as demis as long as they permanently confirm their weakness and fear inferiority by, for instance, showing themselves to be humble. If they do not do this, the so-called Islamic tolerance is over. This is the reason why Israel-related Islamic hatred of Jews has expressed itself in such an aggressive form since the emancipation of the Jews and the rise of Zionism. Without this religious mo motive of hatred for Jews' emancipation, there would have been an israeli palestinian reconciliation long ago. And with this, I'll conclude. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, I well, you needed quite some um attention. Well, Tilma, thank you very much for this very um interesting um presentation that had a lot of content. Uh, we have a few more minutes left for questions, and I can see if you have a question, please raise your hand. I can also see a few questions in the chat. That I'm going to read out. And while the people uh, get ready to ask questions, well, I can't see any raised hands at the moment. Um, I'm going to ask the people who are not panel panelists, but just attendees. Um, I don't see any questions here at the moment. You can still raise your hand. Tillman. Um, against backdrop, I can see the first raised hand by Jens. You get the floor in a second. But uh, Tillman, uh, against backdrop um, of all the things that you described, um, what do you think about the current populations of Israel um, and them being uh, accused of genocide of the Palestinians? You um, displayed very well how this idea of the Jewish uh, people wanting to kill the uh, Germans, wanting to engage in genocide. Um, they want to crucify um, the people. Uh, would you say that this old image um, um, is coming up again when Israel was blamed for genocide in Gaza? Yes, definitely. Because um, how do you usually approach this? Um, First of all, you usually take a look and think about um, evidence. And if you uh, take a closer look at that, uh, you can compare, for instance, the ratio between 
um, killed civilists and killed attackers. This ratio in a lot of wars, um, it's one to eight. So eight civilists die um, if one a militant is being killed. It's not a good ratio. Very bad. Um, whether this um, claim that this, this is correct, it's um, this heatedly debated because um, it's the number of the the uh, people who died during the Iraq War, for instance, um, is not correct. It's too high um, to because they wanted to ex exaggerate a little bit, but the regular ratio is usually one to five, something like that. And we've got, um, after seeing those numbers, we have a ratio of 1 to 1.5, a maximum of 1.2. That's a very good ratio. And we have an uh, incredibly difficult um, position for the Israeli side. Um, it's an asymmetrical fight. Uh, no single um, fighter is wearing a Hamas uniform. They hide uh, their uh, guns under um, clothes and dresses and pretend to be civilists before they start shooting. And we all know that the civil um, institutions such as um, hospitals, um, this kind of civil institutions um, that were used um um, by the Hamas. So this is a war crime by the Hamas. And as a public prosecutor or as a lawyer, you should say that I don't see any evidence um, that would justify to um, continue any investigations for against the Hamas, of course. Hamas openly says um, people often forget after some October the Hamas said that they're going to continue and repeat that uh, and repeat and repeat and repeat that massacre until there's no Israel anymore. And if the Israeli army um, reacted even later um, or didn't intervene at all, then the Hamas would have been able to not just kill 1,000 uh, 1,200 Jews, but 6 million Jews. So the possibility um, is that the Israeli army, what is they doing in Gaza, uh, is they try to avoid a genocide of the Jewish people um, as carried out by the Palestinians, and that is announced, openly announced by the Palestinians. Palestinians. And we always experience anti-Semitism. And as a, we can see a projection here, so uh, what the anti-Semit uh, blames the two to do is actually um, what they themselves wish for in secret. Um, so there's a whole um, uh, branch of sexual um, accusations against Jewish people. And if you take a look at, closer look at that, you can immediately see that this is just a projection, a pure projection. We can see that the Palestinians, for instance, um, talk about um, being driven out, having to flee. And I'm, I'm going to interrupt you, Theron, because you've already um, exp um, answered the question very well. And the other questions I'd like to read out. We have a question. Um, he himself is an activist of a Christian organization who uh, would like to... Um, organize himself against anti-Semitism. Does that mean that I um, in, um, am I in a Christian circle and, and I represent a Christian organization that I um, immediately, um, any kind of attempt to fight anti-Semitism is basically uh, deemed to fail or is disqualified or invalid? Uh, can I even how does he qualify himself? Just by the fact that he has a Christian background, as he's even no, 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 um, that he um can combine his fight against anti-Semitism, anti a fight against anti-Semitism with his Christian conviction. It's a question whether you can connect them, but um, someone who happens to be Christian, um, and may 
be very religious. He could also actively fight anti-Semitism. Yes, of course. Um, well, first of all, not every Christian is an anti-Semite. Not every Muslim is uh, automatically an anti-Semite. Uh, but I always say that it certain people, um, certain ideas that were embedded in the uh, infant's brain that turn into culture at the end. Uh, uh, I was invited by a uh, priest or a, a father, um, and this this uh, father uh, might be even less religious than I am, if that's even possible. But um, I, I, these people exist. You have to be careful whether these are radical ones or uh, who try to uh, mission it, uh, put a mission on all of the Jewish people. But yes, yes, these people do exist. And um, of course, in the Christian church, is, with the Second Vatican uh, Council, there were attempts that, and there were actually fruitful attempts uh, to uh, tackle anti-Semitism um, or try to slow it down. And of course, um, in school nowadays, you only hardly hear about uh, the, the idea that Jewish people have uh, killed our saviour. So these are def there's definitely progress and they're incredibly important of course this is something a christian can do of course but um you shouldn't you don't need to have a con coherent argumentation i first of all say that um the fact that when there's an accusation um a and racist accusation or anything like that um you should take take a look at the accusation whether it's credible whether there's something to it and with the accusation against israel you if you take a look at the information no there's nothing to that accusation okay um so it doesn't mean that there are no uh, innocent victims of course there are they exist and there are thousands of them but it's different um i'm going to uh, summarize the answer of course you can fight uh, try and fight anti-semitism um as a christian um of course you can do that um you can try to fight anti-semitism and combine it with the christian convictions yeah i'd say so i'd say so yeah it's not it's a problem it's not my problem it's a, a problem of the christians who do that and um how to deal with that because in the bible it does say these kind of things but um in the past 2000 uh, years the christian were very um imaginative on how to uh, reinterpret scriptures um so of course you can reinterpret that always and they're christians and uh, last week i went to a memorial service here in berlin for the um hostages and there were several people who gave great speeches and one of the christian embassy of jerusalem I get, she gave a speech and i had to say it was the best uh, presentation and speech uh, but, um i'm not someone who's very i'm not religious at all but um I'm, I'm i don't hate christians or anything christian people um just like anyone else um who was raised a christian as a christian and then turned um atheist they were also indoctrinated as a child to be anti-semitic okay we also have two people who raised their hands Jens but he took his hand no 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 he's still here great and then Jens I would like to ask you to uh, switch on your camera and your microphone and ask a question well yes hello hello Tillman what I'm interested in is we have this um anti-Semitism that we can see very much in Germany, uh, in particular but, um, from Muslims, but also uh, from other people of the society. But these are usually people of, from the left, in particular when it comes to the left. These, uh, um, when it comes to Christian stereotypes, they didn't hear about that that much. So you can see um, a over uh, bordering um anti-semitism that is shaped by christianity or other factors well first of all well these are questions 
where I we can't really go into detail. It's super interesting and it's quite difficult to find evidence for that, for all these things. Theoretically, you should you need to ask all of the individuals about their 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 history and their bio biography. There's a classic example I keep uh, telling people. Well, Tillman, Tarach, your theses, um, they're not credible. The, an atheist, uh, Josef Stalin, he was an anti-Semite. Yeah, yes, he was. But in he grew up in one of the darkest, um, ch church schools in Tsarist Russia, and for years and years, on he took lessons there, um, in a monastery, and he was indoctrinated so much, so that um, it, despite the fact that he turned away from um, the church um, later, um, when you are an infant or a small child, individual, just single sentences are enough when they say, "Well, um, I, the the Jews we have Jews we have to be um, careful." That means that they could be uh, dangerous, and these are sentences that. Um, shapes um a in child incredibly because it is incredibly uh, important for them because they have to learn who's a friend and who's a foe and um you need to check whether the, the left is how it was for them um but i've got other ideas about the left wing people i'm a bit hesitant when saying that well but people um the leftists are more anti-semitic than the um middle of society i've got some doubts about that because the left as an push opposition of course they they have a need to to be against everything and to um be very loud about things and when you hear that we have a state reason in Germany to protect Israel, that 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 of course there will be a left, uh, this purple a person who says it's the opposite. That's kind of understandable from, um, from a leftist point of view. We do everything again, we are against everything that the state says, um, it, and it's not necessarily anti-Semitism. It's just a they just want to say no. But I think the unity of the leftist of the left makes it easier for them to actually utter anti-semitism whereas there is a well, a wish amongst a, a csu politician who thinks that but um don't dare to say these things that would that's the thing that i um assume but this is not just that's just something that i um I assume that's difficult to prove but um we know uh, Jürgen Torfelsen, for instance, he was a member of the CIS or in the um, parliament for years. And then only later you heard about um, his exact ideas because he himself considered himself as a part of the uh, government and uh, of the um, establishment. And they shouldn't say anything against um um, the rules and the la people on the left they, they don't stick to the rules basically they um, do the opposite it's just the disadvantage that the ideas and the founding values of a have a very justified background um, that don't want to be solidarity with Israel um, and, but overall I believe that that of course the um this um child rearing christian child rearing did play a role and of course it was also because it's a dialectical uh development uh, these resentments they um don't stay within the um ch child it's a part of the culture i would like to um read out one more question because we have to close because we went far over time i understand that just one more sentence about Jens question. You had Johannes Passion and Play and um Sebastian Bach. This is a part cu culture um that I mean, a leftist person would listen to that as well. There's one more thing to say. What was it? What was I thinking of?
Well, maybe we can read out another question because we really need to close that session. Linda raised her hand. Um, I can't see her anymore. She took her hand down or she may be no longer with us. Linda, I can't see her anymore. Then we also have I quote Cedar, and this is the last question as well. And I'd like to um keep the question very short and keep the answer short as well, as short as possible, so that we can finish because we um have uh, we have already talked for 90 minutes. Hey quote Siga, please. I can't hear anything. I can't see anything. I can't hear anything. So his hand is raised. Maybe it could be a technical problem. We're going to wait a few more seconds. I can see it in the question and answer part. Yes. Um, but Heiko Siga raised his hand. Heiko Siga also typed the question into the chat. Yes, right. How strong was the influence of the uh, German anti Semitism on? the Arabic Palestinian anti-Semitism because six years of propaganda um, was spread out to the Middle East in Arabic and Persian. Um, there was a uh, radio broadcaster called Tin and Enrique Becker um, talk, uh, talked about that um, great detail in her book i think i was said 80 percent was pure anti-semitism um that was a standard in arabic into these countries of course it had an effect and with these kind of ideas i always want to add that well broadcasting anti-semitism itself is not enough um the um the recipient also needs to be willing and it was there um okay and the the willingness to um take on this nazi propaganda um and to listen to it to um incorporate it uh, the willingness was there and it was there because of the things that i told you um anyway there was there was a um suspicion against the jewish people because they wanted to kill the prophets. I think the answer is clear. So there was a propaganda. The um, influence was there. I think we don't have time to go into greater detail, uh, but I think message is there. So I have to interrupt you. I'm sorry because we need to close. Just one more thing about the end. I just want to say the fact that the origins of anti Semitism can be found in Christianity. That does not mean that everyone, um, uh, that anyone, despite their background, and that's just my opinion, um, you. Maybe you can agree or not agree, but um, you could uh, take a critical look at your own point of view and um, whether you can represent uh, your own point of view. Um, so you should be very critical about that. And I think someone who's um, uh, believes in a Christian point worldview and um, is religious and um, can, they can still actively. Um, fight anti-Semitism and um, can try to fight that Christian uh, anti-Semitic uh, legacy. So um, it's just very important for me because in particular when we fight anti-Semitism, there are a lot of, we need a lot of, uh, we, or we have a lot of important partners on the Christian side as well um, because there was um, research uh, the uh, people who um saved uh, Jews and um, they were, were fighting uh, anti-semitism because of a Christian conviction uh, without denying that the um, ideological roots of anti-semitism are within um Christianity but it's very important for me I don't want anyone to feel like um well um if someone has a Christian point of view um that they uh, are naturally anti-Semitic. That's just something I wanted to point out. Um, I, I, as a host, decided I, I can g give that input to you. Tiaman, thank you very much. It was a, a incredibly uh, interesting and informative presentation. I think we learned a lot. 
and when it comes to the history of anti-Semitism uh, to uh, with regards to today's situation, I think it was a great fit that this was our last presentation of the um, webinar series because it referred back. Uh, it made a connection between um, past and present. I'd like to thank everyone. I'd like to uh, th thank all of the participants of this uh, seminar, but of this presentation, of all of the presentations. And I'd also like to thank everyone for organizing it and executing the sessions. And I'd like to thank very much to um, Mich like to thank Michaela Berge, uh, for translating everything simultaneously. She did a great job. Uh, thank you very much to Eshelay Alpari thank you from ESCAP. Thank you much to Daphne Kleimand for making sure everything works out smoothly when it comes to the technology. Thank you very much to Charles Small, uh, the director of ESCAP, who, who came up with that idea um, for the webinar and shaped it and uh, made it possible. And thank you um, to everyone who participated for being there, for asking questions. Thank you very, very much. I think it was a great series and you, Tillman, um, finished it fantastically. So thank you very much to everyone. I'd like to thank you as well.